I, in our team taught class across Duke, University of Santa, uh, California, Santa Barbara, and Stanford with um, media theorist and legend Howard Rheingold, uh, author of Smart Mobs and more recently of NetSmarts, which is now available in paperback, a brilliant book. And we were talking about anonymity, trolls, and the way people behave can sometimes behave badly in public when nobody knows their name. And Howard, we I wonder if you have some words for all of us, including the public out there who may be listening um, about how you respond in a world where the public can be private and where privacy can be public. Well, um, first of all, I'm of the no mercy for trolls school when it, <laughs> it com comes to trying to facilitate a, a, a community of some kind. That uh, the, the person who convenes a, a meeting or a community or the group who convenes it, they, they have a right to discuss what they want to discuss and not spend their time dealing with with trolls quite often probably every time the the troll will try to to get you into a discussion of free speech and my answer to that in that context you're you're, you're trying to create a learning community or or, or some other uh, kind of community it can be open um, or or closed um, my response is, show me where the Constitution says that. It says Congress shall make no law, and we don't want the state to restrict people's speech, and people are free to say whatever um, they want in, in public. It's, it's actually not public if you're, you're going to try to convene some kind of group. So I reject the, the uh, free speech issue there. I, I will have to say that that um, a student of mine at Stanford wrote a very, a very good honors thesis about anonymity and made a strong case, which I agree with, for the importance of maintaining the the right to anonymity online, and and that has to do with political speech first of all, but also I think there are several kinds of people or, or people in in several kinds of situations who require anonymity. If you are a, um, a subject of spousal abuse and you're afraid your, your abuser is going to find you, um, if you are a substance abuser who is trying to, to, to find help, if you're a whistleblower, those are all good cases for anonymity. I just don't see um, the value of anonymity if it is a, a cloak for um, abuse in some kind of uh, forum. You know, having said that, I would not reject uh, the participation of people who are anonymous or pseudonymous in a, a forum if they're, if they're not attacking people, if, if their behavior conforms to whatever the standards of that, that forum are. I think when you say troll, you're talking about a certain kind of behavior. You're, you're not necessarily saying everyone who chooses to be anonymous is abusive. People have their own reasons. Um, I have found uh, through a lot of experience that a persistent pseudonym is just as useful in a social way in the sense that if somebody is saying, saying something that's uh, ambiguous, you think that, that they might be attacking you or might be saying, saying something that, that you find to be um, uh, abusive. If there's someone who has a persistent pseudonymous identity, you don't know who they are in the, in the, the physical world, but they have a record, you can find out, you can, you can figure out whether this is a person who consistently um, attacks other people or whether that they are not, in which case maybe you're misinterpreting what, what they're saying. A, a, Having a pseudonym enables uh, people to establish a reputation around your your behavior, and so my my advice to to people who are starting communities or or forums in in which they they want to encourage people to not encourage abusive behavior, I'd say that the simplest thing is to require everyone who participates, whether they give you their real name or not, to have a profile. And have their 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 posts, their responses linked to that profile, so that it's easy enough when somebody says something to just click on their name and see what else they've said. So 
I think it's, you know, focusing on behavior is very important. Over. Pardon me? Pseudonyms are fine. Uh, for Haystack, we have profiles. And pseudonyms are fine, but um, you always can track back to somebody's profile. We've actually had very, very little trollish behaviors, except for one Reddit men's group organized attack um, recently. That happened in December, uh, which we did moderate very, very carefully. But um, uh, we've had very little bad behavior. Uh, Chris, does anyone from UC Santa Barbara want to jump in and ask a question of Howard? Yes. Indeed. Hello, I'm seeing, I'm not hearing. I'm, I'm still not hearing your question. Still nothing? Okay, now I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can, can you repeat? Hi, my name is Sean. Uh, Nolan, I'm an uh, uh, English and uh, philosophy major at UCSB. And um, my biggest question is specifically in regards to the information we now have about uh, mass global surveillance. Um, how is how does that affect the uh, internet as a uh, tool for any sort of bottom-up change when any sort of uh, powers that be can uh, be tracking everything that goes on in the internet that happens and manipulating any sort of social change. You, for example, you could see in Egypt there was a uh, a uh, revolt and a revolution, but you could talk about how the people's will has been co-opted, and there's still many of the exact same problems that are going on in Egypt that were going on before the, uh, the when the dictatorship was in place. And my biggest question is, how is um how is the same power of the internet that we're talking about, um how is it a uh, how is that affected by the fact that we've been we are, are probably always going to be compromised security-wise by even the people that are uh, in power? and supposed to be protecting us, so to speak. Okay. Well, you, you're, I think you're asking uh, two questions. Uh, when you mentioned Egypt, I think the question there, and it's an important one, and it's important in Turkey and, and Brazil and other places in, in which there have been mass demonstrations uh, contesting uh, policies of the, of the state. And that question is, um, can the the kind of coordination and um, and incitement that that media many to many media uh, enable that that has has triggered these demonstrations and that has enabled uh, people to organize demonstrations very rapidly um, can that become a movement and I think that there's an important difference. There, when when you're talking about Brazil, it's not it's something that's not publicized a great deal in the U.S. But there were a couple of weeks in which people all over Brazil spontaneously, I mean, on within a couple of days, every city in Brazil um, had very large demonstrations, and those demonstrations included people who didn't necessarily agree with each other politically, otherwise, b because um, as it was explained to me when I was in Brazil, it was really triggered by the, the massive build-out of facilities for the, the World Cup. There, there are cities uh, in which billion-dollar uh, World Cup stadiums are going up and people uh, can't afford public transportation and their schools are in, in very bad shape. So it was a, there was a, a very general agreement about the, the fact that the the state mechanisms of elect, uh, electing uh, representatives and having the elected representatives make policy were so corrupt that there was no other choice for people but to, to go onto the streets. Um, the question there, and the question that we're seeing playing out in Egypt is, uh, after the, the, the excitement dies down, the people who had banded together in Egypt, it was the the, the secular revolutionaries and the, and the and the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, and and in Brazil, it's people from uh, what you would consider the right and the left are are, are often united in this. That a after the excitement of the demonstrations um, dies down, can they build a movement? Can they continue 
to somehow communicate in a way that will influence public policy. And certainly, internet media can um, can be a very useful tool in that regard. But this is a, this is really no longer a communication question. It's a it's a, a political and a social question that about the ability of those people to bridge their their differences and to organize and and to and to speak with each other. And, and I don't think that question has been answered. This is really too young. The the the, the big examples of what I I call uh, smart mobs have have had a great deal to do with deposing the head of state. You know, as early as um, 1999, 2000 in the Philippines. Um, I, I won't enumerate all of the, the instances. Well, it's easier to topple a head of state than to change the political order. And quite often, the head of state changes, but the in, in, entrenched power structure stays the same. So that's a, a, a political question, and I don't claim a, a lot of expertise about that. But back to surveillance, you know, one of the, um, I don't really come at this as a scholar in a particular discipline. I, I, I come at this as someone who started asking questions fairly early about what do these phenomena that, that I'm observing online and with mobile media, what, what do they mean? How do I find out where they might go? That led me to Foucault and not posing as a student of Foucault, I think that Foucault said a couple of really interesting things. One was about um, knowledge power. He always wrote that as one word, knowledge slash power, that there's an intimate connection between the, the two. But also about power and counterpower, um, being akin to what I think biologists look at as arms races. You know, when you, you have very efficient uh, predators like wolves, you get very um, efficiently uh, efficient um, uh, evaders of predators like deer. Deer are not going to run very fast without uh, wolves over the, the long run. The, the relationship between the, the predator and the, the prey um, selects for, for uh, different abilities that enable the prey to evade the predator or the predator to to catch the prey. And I think the same thing is true with power and counterpower. People who have power use that power to hang on to it. And people who don't have power will take anything uh, that comes along. At one point it was the long bow or the stirrup um, or the firearm uh, to, uh, to gain some power that they didn't have. But that doesn't mean that the, the power is going to give way willingly to counter power. They're going to, they're going to, to uh, oppose it. And particularly when we're talking about the politics of the state here, until very recently, power was, was uh, ce centralized. It, it, it was very related to not only the centralization of of power and the mechanisms of the state, but it was related to the centralization of the ability to communicate and coordinate. The police and the military have always had uh, radios that they could communicate in real time. It wasn't until about the, the late 1990s that a sufficient number of citizens had mobile phones where they could co communicate in real time um, outside of their, their homes. It wasn't until the internet that many-to-many uh, -many communication enabled large numbers of people to broadcast their views. Uh, you had to own a printing press or a broadcasting station, radio station, or a television station. For the most part, for a, a pretty long time, the mechanisms of states were ignorant of what was happening with the Internet. Certainly, if they had known, they would have controlled it much earlier. I think we, we certainly saw a turning point before the NSA revelations when it was clear that um, the Iranian um, uh, demonstrations after the June 2009 elections that the state was, was u becoming very sophisticated in its use of the internet. They were being able to track people's IP addresses. They were creating honeypots that were attracting activists that they could track down and 
apprehend no longer was the advantage of knowledge, uh, of knowing um, how to use these media um, in the hands of counterpower. The, the, the state became sophisticated uh, in, in that use in the way that it wasn't before. And we now know that, that state surveillance in the U.S., and I think that there's little doubt that it happens elsewhere, it's just that the U.S., I think, pretty clearly has a very advanced, maybe China and Russia are, are, are as advanced, we don't know, but have the very advanced means of sweeping up communications and, and surveilling those communications. I think that there's still um, a lot of wiggle room for people who are uh, desperate enough and or brave enough to to take the risk. Um, being able to surveil does not necessarily mean being able to act, and that that may not be true forever. But you know, it would quite famously the CIA knew about uh, several of the 9/11 um, hijackers. They knew that they were dangerous, they knew that they were in the U.S., and they failed to convey that to the FBI. There was an FBI agent who desperately tried to convey that he knew that there were um, suspicious people trying to learn how to, to uh, fly uh, 747s, but weren't interested in how to land them. Um, so knowing uh, something isn't the same as, as being able to act swiftly on it. What it, what it does mean is that if the state wants you, if it wants an, a particular individual, they're going to be able to, to get you. Um, they're going to be able to use the internet and mobile media to, to find you. Uh, we're seeing the first steps of counterpower. There was, I can't remember, I think it was called the Black Phone. There was an announcement of, of a, a, a highly encrypted Android phone that, that you could destroy um, very swiftly. That's, that's being offered is not going to be something that, that barefoot revolutionaries are going to be able to afford. People do use Tor and encryption and encryption and maybe that, that, uh, that knowledge is, is, is going to spread, but I think you're right. I think the advantage has shifted to the state. And, um, and I don't think that this power, counter power, um, co-evolution is over. I think that the technology continues to evolve and that gives advantages to, to both sides. Thank you. you go ahead? Yeah, I guess I'll go ahead. Hi, Professor Reingold. Um, I, I guess my question is uh, more related to pedagogy and uh, I was curious throughout the book and reading um, if you were to have a classroom of fifth graders and you want to begin an introduction on it, attention, collaboration, participation, craft detection, and networking, what would be the fundamental tools or ways that you'd cultivate and develop these 21st century literacies? Well, I think uh, I'll, I'll just try to briefly address each of them. Um, attention, that is a, a good time to start dealing with attention. You know, I don't think that, that, that one should expect a great deal of a, a fifth grader in that regard and that, that cognitively they are, are still developing. I do think that it is a good time to, to introduce the idea of having some control of your attention or the ability to notice where your attention is, if nothing else. The ability to notice where your attention is, what you know, what is, you know, somewhat more fancily called metacognition, there there is increasing evidence that that metacognition is is is, is helpful to learning, that not just knowing w that you're you're doodling and staring out the window and not paying attention, or that you are paying attention, but being aware that you have different mental tools that that help you learn or entertain yourself in different circumstances and that you can you can match the appropriate tool to the circumstance. I do uh, attention probes with my college students. I think that would be perfectly acceptable with, with, with fifth graders. Um, 
for example, at a random interval, ring a bell and uh, ask people to write on a, what they're thinking. Um, if you're thinking about what we're discussing in the classroom, you write it on, let's say, a yellow sticky. And if you're, you're thinking about something that's kind of related, then um, an orange sticky. And if it's something that has nothing to do with what's going on, 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 a, on a red sticky. And you do that anonymously, and you put it up on the board, and you just get a kind of snapshot a couple of times an hour of where people's attention is. And you know, the thing about metacognition is once you start being aware of where you're putting your attention, that strengthens your ability to do that. And another uh, attention probe that's kind of a fun exercise uh, to, to get a group of people to understand that there's an attention to a group is uh, to ask the group, let's say you've got uh, 15 people, to count from 1 to 15. Um, if uh, and one, uh, each person only says a number once, and if two people collide, you start from the beginning. And if there's a hesitation of more than a second, you start from the beginning. And it's amazingly difficult to do. It's harder to do than you think. And then, um, and then you ask people to do it with their eyes closed. And quite often, it's much easier to do. Anyway, there are a number of these attention probes, really simple exercises. The thing about attention is you're, just, you're, you're drawing people's attention to it. I don't think you need to get more complex than that. In terms of uh, participation, I've done a number of interviews for dmlcentral.net um, with teachers of fifth graders and, and third graders who have them blog for the world. I, you know, clearly you have to moderate the comments on that. And, um, and you need to be clear with the parents about what's, what's going on there and give people an opportunity to opt out if they, they want to opt out. Uh, but writing a paper for the teacher and you get a grade or a gold star, um, how does that compare to writing a blog post and somebody on the other side of the world responding positively um, to that? You know, like it or not, today's fifth graders are going to be living um, in public a great deal whether you choose to build a, a digital profile, other people are going to tag you, you're going to be, um, you're going to have a digital footprint anyway. Um, it's never too early to, to take positive control of that. But I think there are two issues there. One is learning to live on the, on, on the web, the, the way it's constituted now. But I think the other Part of it is the is the pedagogical one, which is, is it's not just um, interesting and, and 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 thrilling and empowering to see that you can write something that, that other people in the world re respond to. I think it naturally leads into the the um, the issue of participation. That the the web exists not because. Um, the internet uh, uh, was was really populated not by by people by governments or or corporations by but by a lot of people and and early on the web there were a lot of people just putting up pictures of their their uh, their pets and um, and linking to each other the danger of enclosure of um, Facebook primarily, but also we're looking at um, uh, Apple and Google and Amazon um, being kind of the official face of the, of the online world of the web of um, what AOL tried to do and failed to do um, to control the the uh, the content online. I think that the only um, answer to that is for or ordinary people of all kinds to participate. And I, I don't think that it's too early to teach uh, young children that the, the ability to get any answer, answer to any question um, w within seconds um, from anywhere, that the existence of that, that knowledge commons exists because of participation and that there's a, uh, a responsibility to maintain the commons by, by participating in it. And in terms of collaboration, we're also seeing fifth graders using Skype, um, using wikis and blogs to collaborate online. I, I don't think I need to 
speak very long about the mismatch between the uh, traditional pedagogy of you know you write papers, you compete with students um, for grades, and uh, and it's pretty much kind of an individual exercise in which you are banking your 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 learning um, for your own uh, benefit. Um, we're we're clearly seeing. Um, a, a shift to an understanding of the value that, that goes all the way back. We're humans because we're social learners. Um, the value of collaborative learning or, or cooperative learning. Collaborative being we work on projects together. Cooperative being that we acknowledge that we all have a role in learning from and helping each other learn. I think the educational institutions are kind of slow to pick that up. They've got a, a very old model and schooling as as um, uh, Kathy Davidson has pointed out, is very much based on a, a social and political model of control that goes back to the 19th century and in, in industrial society. You want me to go on? I have yes. a question. Hi, this yes. is Mitchell Stevens at Stanford. Uh, this was going to be a response to a, a prior comment, but it's actually connected to what you said here as well. You talked about the state uh, being uh, uh, having the upper hand in terms of information. I, uh, I've been going on record as often as I can saying it's, it's really the information corporations that have the upper hand. Uh, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, the Amazons. Um, all those fifth graders who are collaborating on Skype are leaving digital traces that are available to uh, profit-seeking third parties who probably know more about their, their lives uh, than any government uh, agency in the United States does. I'm wondering if you could comment on um, you know, this, the, the, the changing balance of knowledge power uh, between uh, Civil society, pub, uh, comp, uh, regular citizens, uh, government, and then what I'm calling information corporations, but you can call them anything you want. Well, you know, certainly that's an issue. I think you have to distinguish between the issues and identify the bridge between the issues. And I think that for for Google, the um, the big point about the Snowden revelations was that the NSA was tapping. Google, that um, the state has a license to um, detain, incarcerate, and execute uh, citizens. The state has the um, monopoly license on violence ag ag against citizens. Our, our law wait, enforcement. Wait, wait, which which state, Howard? Which one? Any, the United any, States. Any any state in which um, you have law, armed law enforcement and you, you have uh, the ability of the people governing to incarcerate and execute their citizens. I mean, I guess the reason Presumably in democratic that... states there is a, um, a procedure um, uh, by which a... I mean, that's, you know, part of the, the, the issue of both with the information corporations and with the U.S. government is that uh, if you are law enforcement, you're supposed to go to a judge and get a warrant. And you might snoop on people, but you cannot use what you've um, learned by snooping on them in a court of law to put them away. Clearly, I mean, we're seeing a shift in that now. But there's the supposed to be a back. The reason I'm pushing back is because you know Google and Amazon are are transnational entities. I mean the the state the U.S. state only has capacity to the limits of its national borders. Well, uh, unless you're willing to defect, you, and you're a U.S. citizen, you don't have much choice. Um, I could easily use Bing. It's you, you know it's just as good as Google. Um, Google's got the brand. Bing is an excellent search engine. Um, I would think that if people found out that Google was making their embarrassing search histories uh, public, um, maybe people are not going to care whether they, they collude. So a lot of people are not going to care whether they, they collude with the, the, the government outside of the uh, due procedural requests. But um, 
uh, Google cares about their stock price and they care about their competition. The, there is no competition to the state. So I think that's one of the important reasons for maintaining some, some degree of competition. When you're talking about Amazon, there's not a lot of competition. At least we've got Google and Microsoft and Yahoo are all trying to compete for search. But, but yeah, it's, a, it's a, a huge danger. But I think you have, you know, the, the, the corporations, they want to sell us things. They want to sell that information to other people so that they can make a profit and their, their return a profit to their, their shareholders. And, and the reason other people want to buy that information is so that they can sell us things. As far as we know, that has not uh, extended to controlling our political behavior, which is what the state does and attempts to do. And I think it's important to make that distinction. I think the, the issue of all of those little bits of data, you know, what's, what you might uh, call data valence, that, that being able to put together extremely detailed portraits of individuals and their behavior is an issue. And, I, and the issue comes down to how it is used. You know, there's the, the, the famous story, of, or, you know, recently famous story of the, the irate father who went to the, the um, I think it was Target store, to, because his da daughter was being sent uh, information about uh, uh, supplies for pregnant women, because they, because Target has a lot of data that indicates um, pregnant women, even if they don't know they're pregnant, start ordering unscented products at a certain point. So there are lots of ways that selling things to you and selling information about selling things to you can have a negative impact on your life. And I, so I think that there are ser reasons for serious concern about that. I would still differentiate between that and the state. And I would say that, that if uh, it was discovered that Google and Yahoo and Facebook were collaborating um, with the NSA on a, a large scale rather than the tens of thousands of, re of requests they say that they are um, answering, considering the fact that they have billions of, of searches and, uh, and trillions of pieces of data that's relatively small. I think that that would be a political issue. I think what is a political issue is discovering that NSA has been tapping into that information and adding it to the information that they have. I think what's really dangerous is if the information that the information corporations are able to gather from our, our everyday behavior online, so, if that so, was available so, to the so state. So Google's, Google's knowing more about me than the federal government does is completely unproblematic to you? No, it's not completely unproblematic. What would be um, much more problematic would be if the state, if they shared that information with the state, I think that's a, a different situation and a different set of problems. It's it's less of a a political issue and and more of a a social issue. Are we in a do how many people are comfortable in a society where your activities are are known that way? You know, I I just uh, I think uh, you probably remember um, pretty good privacy. There was an attempt in the 1990s to, to get citizens to use encryption um, and nobody did. Maybe that will happen. Maybe the power, counter power will, will shift and, and enough people will object to having that information about themselves uh, known and centralized that they will take uh, countermeasures. Thank you. Yeah, good question. It's not as if I have an answer to it, but uh, I do think that, that it's important to understand the unique power of the state. Google and Facebook can't execute you. They can't send a robot to kill you without a warrant. <laughs> and apparently the President of the United States can't. Okay, I think it's Duke's turn next.
Hi, it's Matthew Clark from Duke University. I have a follow-up to the discussion that um, you were just having with Mitchell Stevens. It, it was exceedingly interesting, and I was wondering if you think there's a sense in which uh, multinational corporations are now producing the very data that they're collecting. No, no. And and if 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 that is the case. Is there also a sense in which they're usurping the power that we as human beings have to create our own culture? And maybe that's something that corporations can do that the state, well, really doesn't involve itself in so much. Maybe that is more dangerous than the kind of power that states have over us. Um, just your comments. And well, thank there's you. the you know the the theory of the public sphere and the the original fears of the theorists of the public sphere which without getting into too much detail I would say has to do with uh, citizens who want to govern themselves and be citizens rather than subjects it's not just about electing your leaders it's about a sufficient number of people having the, the knowledge and the freedom to talk about the issues that concern them and thus form public opinion and presumably use public opinion to, to influence the state. The fear was that private interests would, um, with the advent of public relations, be able to scientifically manipulate public opinion. So um, I, I think that that's an aspect of what you're, you're talking about. If the, the, the people who make policy at the big information corporations have a motive for manipulating public opinion, then they certainly have a great deal of, of power to, to do so. But I think when you're talking about creating content, to me, that is one of the aspects of the, the fear about net neutrality, that the, the information utilities, the companies that, that profit um, by transporting the data that we that consi that our communication consists of if they also have some say over what the content that they um, that they transport or, or choose not to transport then that gives them well I mean the reason why one is fearful of Comcast um, having the the, the, the power to decide which content gets to people faster is that Comcast now produces content. They own companies that produce content. So if there's a, a small number of information utilities that are the, the, the carriers and of, um, of bits um, begin to be producers of content, they have a disproportionate power to influence and, and persuade people. And I think the, the great power shift that the internet provided, um, certainly in its, its early years, is that you, you didn't have to have the ear of a first or a, a Pulitzer or an, an NBC in order to reach the world. You, you could reach the world from your desktop or, or, or from your computer. Um, that was a huge power shift. Um, that's not to say that mass media have gone away or that the ability to to influence and subvert mass media is, is, is no longer an interest of political actors um, or that they they have stopped being successful at it or that, that in fact I think the, the tools that information technology provides makes it possible to to target manipulate manipulation much better than ever before. I think, you know, one of the, my motives for writing that smart was um, how are you going to react to this? Are, are, there's, there's, I think the danger of learned helplessness, that, that citizens are just going to throw up our, our hands because you, we don't have control over these information utilities. We apparently don't have control over the, the state. I mean, today the news is um, whether the uh, Senate in, in intelligence committee is, is going to take action o over the revelation that the CIA was spying on them. So, you know, we, we may see 
we, we may be seeing a shift in power that, that people have talked about for a while, which is it's not really the visible state, but the invisible state that, that's been hugely empowered by information technology that's, that's now um, pulling the strings. So I, I think what can you do about it is, is um, know about it. Um, the more people understand the way their information is, is being used, the more people who understand what net neutrality means. I mean, you have to be a, a, a technology geek and a policy wonk to even know what the, the phrase means these days, but it, it influences everybody's future. I mean, I, I, I'm seeing some facial expression and body language here, and I'm, <laughs> I'm interested in what your reactions are to what I'm saying. Um, I, I guess my concern, um, and, and maybe again this feeds back into what uh, Mitchell Stevens was saying, is that corporations are inventing a new kind of power, uh, a, power to sh a power that can shape my own freedom, uh, my ability to think critically about how I understand the world. I'm, I'm worried that corporations can actually influence my ability to think critically about how I understand the world. And that is dangerous. Something that I'm far more concerned about than the power that the state has over my body or over my livelihood, etc. Here, here. I would, I would argue that the state has the same type of power. And it, I mean, it's, it's, there, it's all interlocking together. I think the state has a similar type of power in its policy issues on all sorts of commodities. I mean, the FCC in general, and net neutrality being struck down. Um, I, I think that it's, 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 it's an error to think that only the corporations have that type of power. The state does have that type of power, too, in addition to also having that physical you know, avenue of uh, strength. Oh, you know, I would recommend a book by Fred Turner that, that just came out called The Democratic Surround, yeah. in which he he talks about the way the United States um, tried to shape the democratic personality starting in World War II and, and continuing um, through the, the 1950s into the 1960s um, using media to uh, try to shape the way citizens um, perceive the world. So uh, without a doubt, states have been in that business um, forever, and um, they just have much, much better tools now. You know, when you talk about the power of multinational corporations, there was a, a movie made a very long time ago called Rollerball that you might want to, to, to watch about a, a future in which states have somewhat withered away. But, um, you know, I, I just, I have to, I have to make a distinction here. Um, when, when people said that the Internet was going to dissolve national boundaries, I said, uh, what are you going to do about the nuclear weapons that states have now? States, as far as anybody knows, are the only ones who have nuclear weapons. And there are an awful lot of them out there. Um, and it's pretty well known from the, uh, the research on nuclear winter that not a lot of them have to go off to pretty much kill 90% or more of the human population. And I'd go, I would just caution you about making uh, that distinction between the state and the corporation prematurely. Until those corporations have control of those weapons, and you know they're made by people like General Electric, but they aren't, you know, th this is a whole other story. It wasn't really until fairly recently, I think in the 1960s, that the power to drop a nuclear bomb was taken away from the Air Force and the chain of command was um, invested in the President uh, of the United States. I think it's very important to understand the, the mechanism. That's due process raised to the level of executing the world. And I think that the danger of, of multinational corporations is of them gaining more power than states. Um, yeah, if, I, if I could just sort of jump in here. I think that there is an interesting fact that you know so much of our government and, and the people in power are sitting on corporate boards. I mean, they're they're often the same people with competing. Their interests are not necessarily um, 
convergent or divergent. I think we have to look at the very specific cases in which the state and corporate interests are in sync, and at other times they are delinked. And I also think about the fact that the public, in, in terms of a kind of global public, is also split. In other words, there are times and cases in which there can be mass um, movements of, of um, consolidation and coalition building, and then local interests can, can kick in very powerfully as well. So I think that it's hard to make a lot of And I think that um, the, the Internet has been instrumental in bringing out these, both these tensions and new um, convergences and divergences. Uh, am I here? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. here we go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm here. Somebody's got um, a mic. I just, I, Howard, I gotta say, I think you have a very 20th century conception of power. Um, you know, you're, you're bringing out nuclear weapons here. I mean, the entire federal government has been financialized and is is arguably weaker than the financial markets in New York City and Hong Kong. We have Google that aggregates more data than any nation state on Earth, and you're telling us to keep worrying about Washington. I'm just not quite clear how to square what you're saying with uh, your invocation of Foucault earlier. Are, are you suggesting that it's a, a zero-sum game? That you either no, worry about not. you either worry about Washington or you worry about corporate power. I think we should be much more worried about about uh, information corporations at this moment in history than any government agency. Well, I guess we would disagree uh, about that, but uh, that's not the, the same thing as, as saying that um, that we we uh, shouldn't worry about uh, corporate power. I'm, I would not say that uh, at all. I would I would worry very much about it. Um, but uh, I, I just I, I just think that there's a distinction. There should be a distinction that the the people you give the power to to uh, seize you, and incarcerate you, shoot you on the on on the street, uh, or execute you. That uh, at least in the U.S. we have the illusion that there's supposed to be a due process, and um, uh, courts aren't fair and. Uh, not everybody has a access to them uh, to good lawyers, but there's presumably a a, a process. Um, I think that we need to keep our eye on that process, and that 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 that's a very Im important, uh, crucial issue now with the revelations about surveillance. We we know that the intelligence uh, community has been in the service of corporations all over the world. That's not really a, a in, in dispute. Um, the amount of power that they now have to uh, surveil and control individuals because of the technology is, 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 is making that a very, very different game. Um, but no, I would not, I would not uh, discount the danger of the uh, of entities that don't answer to to anybody's citizens, um, they answer to their stockholders. To some degree, they answer to their customers, and I think that there's there's uh, some room for ambiguity there. You know, if tomorrow everybody stopped using Google and started using um, Bing, that would ha have an enormous impact. Uh, I I I can't see a similar situation happening um, on a mass scale. Uh, regarding the state, the last time we really saw that was white, uh, was was the civil disobedience during the civil rights era. Howard, uh, yeah. before we stop, uh, we wanted to ask you a question about the relation between your work and the university. Hi, my name is Natalie. Um, my question relates to your um, introduction, where you say that the future of digital culture, yours, mine, and ours, depends on how well we learn to use the media. Um, if we do, as you suggest, and make a conscious effort to learn how to use technology in the right way and how to use that knowledge in our professional and personal lives in the future as society evolves, how do you see the university changing in, say, about 20 years? Well, you know, I, I have to say that um, 
there are are still um, many people um, who can stand up and talk for an hour and and convey and 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 keep the attention of a room full of students. I'll, I'll also have to say that that mode of, of transmission of knowledge that's been going on since maybe ancient uh, Sumeria um, is no longer a monopoly. I think what's, what's really interesting is that um, on the one hand, humans are social learners. Um, we are the only primates who can identify where uh, other primates are looking so that we can learn by looking at them and, and human babies do that very very um, early schooling is has not been a great deal about social learning it's a, 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 about what Farah called the you know the, the the banking model in which the the professor has the, the knowledge and they transmit that knowledge usually through lectures texts and and tests and the students bank that knowledge um, now, outside of the university, there's all kinds of learning going on. It's you know whether it's uh, on on YouTube or whether it's gamers or um, communities of of interest uh, uh, of around all kinds of things. Uh, people no longer have to go to school to learn most things. I think that that over the long run, if uh, you know the old. Uh, business model of you put a lot of work into creating a, a syllabus and a series of lectures and then you, you, you kind of write on that for years and years and years that, that, that that's very challenged but I, I also think that the universities as as with other kinds of uh, learning institutions benefit from opening up the uh, ability for students to co-learn with each other you know, and that doesn't, re that's enabled by and empowered by technology, but that, that's really a pedagogical issue. It, it, the, the technology kind of forces the issue, but I, I don't think that, that you require sophisticated technology to do that. You can, you can do that with, with whiteboards and, and, and post-it notes and, and just empowering the students to, to speak. Um, I also think that uh, that universities have been asleep to the power of information technologies for a long time, and they no longer are. And that gives efforts like like this MOOC and other things that that Professor Davidson has been doing, and and others um, have been doing that that gives them the the power to influence a institutions that have largely been governed by inertia. This is the way we've always done things um, and that's what, what's always worked. So I, I think that there are that what we're seeing is an opening up of the institutional resistance to change that's been triggered by the technology and the technology enables a lot of um, interconnection but I, I, I just want I just want to emphasize that we're, what we're talking about is a pedagogical decision, and you can be without sophisticated technology and recognize that students can be empowered to be co-learners. That's great. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to peel off because a number of us, myself and two of the students in, in the Duke class, are heading to Boston right now to be part of the Digital Media and Learning Conference. I gather, Howard, you're not going to be at DML conference this I year. I will not. No. Ah, uh, we will miss I you. I wish I was. We'll miss you. I think we've got, we're grabbing a quick sandwich and then we have a car taking us to the airport, so we're going to have to say goodbye to everyone. Duke, Stanford, I mean Stanford and UCSB, it's been fantastic to share time with you. Howard, thank you for joining us today. Um, Stanford students and UCSB students, we still have our group. Um, if you want to participate in our Designing Higher Ed from Scratch or if you have projects that we can participate in from the Duke side, we'd love to. And whatever happens, happy, happy life, everybody. And, and I hope we can continue to be comrades. Uh, we got a lot of things to fight out there. And I hope we can be allies in whatever that movement looks like. Thanks, Kathy. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Howard.